Yeah. You have to go with the other one. The one. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Mama cut them, you know. You think that was yeah, this is off the record here? Maybe you guys thought it was necessary for his great math math mathematician or something these things go together. Mm -hmm. You know, being crazy and being, you know. He was the yeah. quintessential okay. example of that sort of thing. This is a Rolls Okay, so okay. we can continue. So you were talking about crime. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Latvi. Right. Let, yeah, let me ask you another question, Latvi, okay? I want to sort of go back a little bit into your own personal life. And was, this question always interests me. Here you were some, some student somewhere in some foreign, way away place in, in Iran, Azerbaijan, which is very, very far away. What, what was it that made you want to come to the United States to go to school? What was it that motivated you to take this long journey? From, you know, very, at a very, very kind of, the world was very, very chaotic at that time. Did you say something about that? Well, you see, I was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, which at that time, that was 1921, was a part of the Soviet Union. So my language was Russian language. And so I went through the first three grades. Uh, things became difficult in Soviet Union at that time. My parents were Iranian citizens, and so they returned to Iran. And they placed me in an American missionary school. When I came in contact with Presbyterian missionaries, mostly from Midwest, Kentucky, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, etc. Wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, I uh, was deeply influenced by my teachers at that time. And it was during that period that I developed this ambition to go to the United States at some point. My parents were well off, so I had good life. And uh, when I completed this American college, then I entered the University of Tehran, which again is altogether a different world. There, the influence primarily French, all of our textbooks were French textbooks. And, uh, and after I received my degree, in bachelor's degree in electrical in 1942 then, uh, the question was, was what to do. Now, at that time, uh, there were American troops in Iran. Tehran was basically under the control of so-called Persian Gulf Command. So I got to know quite a few Americans because of, I spoke English. And my father had a business building supplies and things of this kind. And so then I became some sort of intermediary. Uh, intermediary and my income was hard at that time. Very high. And, uh, but then uh, I thought that, you know, if I stay in Iran, okay, I'll have good life, but it'll be a life of doing nothing basically, you see. Doing nothing. Playing cards, which I was not interested in, or having expensive meals or whatever, drinking, smoking, whatever. So I was always interested in science ever since I can remember myself, since the age of six. And that was the Soviet influence in Baku. And uh, so uh, by that time, you know, I had money. So I thought, well, now is the time to go to the United States to continue my education. I came to the United States not as a student, as an immigrant, because I decided that that's the country where I want to spend the rest of my life. And uh, while I was in Tehran, I applied for admission to MIT. And I was admitted. And the reason why I was admitted, I think, was that at MIT there were not that many students work on young people who are in the army. 
so I was admitted, and uh, I entered MIT uh, in July 19, of oh, September 1944. And I must tell you that uh, MIT compared to University of Texas was very easy. It was more rigorous, the kind of training that I got University of Tehran, which was in the French tradition, uh, was more rigorous. So that I would finish all the exams in half the time at MIT. And, uh, but there were all kinds of subjects that uh, I was not exposed to while I was at the University of Tehran. So I was in the department of Nigeria with only three students. And two courses, a whole course in armature wiring. Armature wiring, of right. course, in armature wiring. You know. Yeah, right. This is, this is energy here. Yeah. yeah. Courses like that. Yeah. Telephony. Not smart telephony, but conventional. Yeah, I, I took courses like that myself. <laughs> Not <laughs> really <laughs> exciting subject. No. So when I came to MIT, it was exciting not only in terms of the people, but things I never heard of before. And uh, so, but uh, the training by the University of Tehran was excellent training, excellent training. And uh, as I said, it was in the French tradition because most of my professors at the University of Tehran were graduates of so-called Grands Ecoles in France, École Polytechnique, École Dormant, École Supérieure d'Electricité, etc., etc. So, you did not ask me that question, but uh, if, I, if you did, I would say that life in the United States today is orders of magnitude more difficult than it was when I started my teaching career at Columbia University. My salary was $2,500 a year as an instructor. At that time, graduates of MIT, master's degree, were getting a $50 a week. But New York Times was five cents. Subway was five cents. Brand new car, $1,500. <laughs> it was a different form. You submitted a proposal to NSF, asked for two-page proposal, asking for $20,000, and the probability 95 or no, you got over $20,000. Money was so easy to get because a lot of work was supported by the Defense Department. Just to give you an example, Air Force was begging MIT to accept money to do research. MIT didn't want it. So MIT eventually grudgingly agreed to set up Lincoln Laboratories. Lincoln Laboratories, yes. Sort of separate from my Now, uh, so when I started my teaching career, my, uh, NSF was, came into existence at about that time, a little bit later. The budget of NSF initially was $15 million. Tells you something. Fifteen million dollars today, it is three or four or five or six billion dollars. Billion, yeah. Different world, yeah. different world. So I can't say that uh, it was a better world. I can't say it was a better world, but uh, it was uh, a world in which it was much easier to get a job, to make a living, to buy a house. They got insured in all of those respects. Quite simple. Now, um, I guess it was a better world to be a younger person in than it is today. Pardon? I said it was a better world to be a younger person in than today. Yes. Now, let me ask you another question. Of course, one of the, I guess, more prominent uh, achievements of your life, and bringing it somewhat notoriety, was the, the book you did with the saw. I think this was a very important book. Could you just comment a little bit about that, that yes. experience? Well, uh, and I was at Columbia at that time, 
and that more for the Bell Labs, and I wrote a paper on finite state machines, 1953-54. And uh, I was very impressed by Moore's ideas. By Moore, uh, very impressed. And uh, so basically my uh, in systems analysis, my field was linear systems, continuous systems, to a lesser degree non-linear systems, uh, but not finite state system. So finite state system was a new world. So uh, then I began to teach courses on finite state systems at Columbia University. And at some point then, it occurred to me that I could sort of combine linear system theory with finite state machines. In the case of finite state machines, the concept of state played a central role. So a linear system theory, uh, the way it was presented by 1963 book with Charlie de Sor, uh, the first four chapters were written by me. Those chapters were basically an exposition of an approach in which you form a combination. A combination. And so state-space approach is routine now. People use state-space approach all over the place. And uh, so, but it was very different from the linear system theory which is oriented towards Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms and differential equations uh, and things of this kind. So uh, it had, I think, uh, uh, I, hear, I think it had a certain impact. Uh, but uh, the impact was nowhere nearly as uh, visible as the impact of fuzzy sets. I guess the next question in this regard, I guess this leads me to the next question. Is, at some point here, you make any transition. I mean, from this electrical engineering world, which is differential equations, and then you go to a whole different world. In, in, at least, I mean, the, the tools are different. You're talking about sets. You're talking about logic. How did, what, could you say something a little about your transition, that transition from the... Yeah, <coughs> that's a very good question. It's a very good question. So, uh, my... Uh, as I said already, uh, my field in systems analysis was the field of linear, most linear systems. I wrote a few things on non-linear systems, but basically it was linear systems. And uh, as I mentioned already, under the influence of Ed Moore's work, I moved toward the concept of state and uh, the concept of state and uh, concepts associated with the concept of states. And uh, so finite state machines close to computers. So uh, I was always interested in computers, but uh, when I was growing up, they were not in existence. They came in existence uh, came to existence in late 50s, in early 60s to a limited extent, but not to a point where people, you know, using them all over the place. So, but uh, even though I was not close to the world of computers, nevertheless I felt that that is the world of the future. And in 1950 I wrote a paper called Thinking Machines, a new field in electrical engineering. And that was six years before AI was born. You see that but there is one example uh, that I forgot about uh, until Rudy Sizing refreshed my memory. Uh, I called it Electronic Director of Admissions. So in 1950 paper, I talked about, I said 1965, looking 50 years ahead, trustees of Columbia University decided to disband the Office of Admissions 
and replace it with electronic copies. And then I describe it would be the, the rule-based system. You have student's record and various uh, attributes, parameters, and then you have correction of rules. If this and this and this and that, then don't admit or admit or whatever. So I describe this rule-based system there. So, uh, so I was sort of gravitated over there. So in 1959, I came to Berkeley. And at Berkeley then, I taught, on the one hand, finite state systems, on the other hand, something having to do with linear systems. And then in 1963, I was appointed as chair of the department. And that uh, was the period when computer science began to become visible. And a war started between electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. And I was for pushing computer science within electrical engineering. And Professor Abe Tau, who was the director of Computer Center at that time, was pushing for a separate department. So, so I was pushing computing computers in EE, hiring various people and uh, starting programs. So I became much closer to that world than I was prior to my becoming chair of the department. But again, my involvement was not of the kind where I really did something computers. It was sort of administrative in many respects. So uh, in, from 19, in 1965, then I came up with my paper while I was chair of the department. In 1967, we changed the name to Electrical Computer Science. The first department to change its name. And I pat myself on the back for persuading the people at, in the department to go along with it. Many people were opposed to it. Well, uh, so, uh, so my term as chair came to an end in 1968. At that time, I decided to do something about it. So I took a leave of, it was sabbatical leave, half of which I spent at IBM's research laboratory, and half at MIT's project lab. And it was during that period that I retreaded myself, so that when I came back to the department in '68. I no longer taught courses in systems analysis. I began to teach elementary courses in programming and not so elementary courses in query languages because I learned some things at the idea and uh, things of this kind and that change the direction of my life, 68. So, but the war between computer science and he continued. Eventually, the Department of Computer Science, which was set up also in 67, was disbanded. And the people in the department were absorbed in EECS. And at that point, Division of Computer Science was formed in EECS. I moved into that division. From 1972 on, I was a member of the Computer Science Division. I still am. I see. That's very interesting. Because I was around sort of students, you know, in that time when, they, when you were the first was space, space first was coming in. So it was very interesting. Very interesting. Now, let me ask you another question. Is there any direct inspiration you could uh, account for your development of fuzzy sets? I mean, I guess maybe you've been asked this a lot of times. You know, what is the, what was your inspiration to some extent? Not really. In other words, uh, I tried to Persuade her brothers, my eminent friend, probably to do something. I could see there is a need for that. I tried to persuade Dick Bellman, who was my best friend, but both of them were busy with their own problems. 
But I feel it's increasing with that there's something is lacking. That what I know, linear system theory, this, that, so forth, could not deal with arm sharpness of cross boundaries. You could not deal with that. So I, my 61 paper called from system from circuit to system theory, I, I do say that we need something, we need fuzzy concepts. I said it there, 61. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was always in the back of my mind. I see. So, so the idea occurred to me in 64. The paper was probably 65. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time I was chair, but even though I was chair, I never really stopped thinking about or participate conferences and writing. I never became 100% administrator, even though we had a war now. Yeah. So I must say that uh, that uh, my uh, development of the concept of sets to a considerable degree was also a matter of luck, so accident, luck, and so forth. Uh, and had I not developed a concept today, again, I would be, I would sue. I would be something. But uh, I would not really be uh, sort of initiator of something that has followers. I think that this is an important criteria. Yeah. Do we have followers or not? Now, we did this work on over uh, aggregation operators. It has many fo followers, you see. So your name is associated with, with something. There are many, many people in the academic world who rise to a position of prominence. Uh, they get elected, they get all uh, the academies, this, that, they get all kinds of awards, but they never develop a following. So uh, there's no legacy. They pass away, they're forgotten. Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. That brings us something I was going to talk to you about later, but I think I bring it up now. In, other words, in, in some regards, I mean, fuzzy sets is fuzzy sets. There's no real zotties fuzzy sets. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I've always thought that perhaps, you know, um, that, you know, something with your name, because again, as history goes by, even now you see more and more when people refer to fuzzy sets. It's like, and we had talked about the our idea of having sort of zotties extension principle. Could you comment about, you know, how you feel about something like that? Yes, I think that if you look at history of many fields, in particular mathematics, uh, you find that some names stay because they're associated with some concept, like right. house, door, distance, right. or uh, dedicated hearts, you know, things of this kind. Correct. Yes. And in some cases, uh, people have done a lot, but somehow the name did not get attached mm -hmm. to something. I think an example would be uh, von Neumann. I, 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 I'm not completely sure, but offhand I can think of something with the name of von Neumann. Right, right. More reasonable. Maybe. The von Neumann machine, but that's not so popular. Uh, yeah. But so. Uh, so anyway, yes. So uh, one thing to which my name sort of got attached to some degree, and I think I'm sort of pleased with that, is extension principle. Uh, I, not at all, uh, let's see, uh, I can't think of the wrong to describe it. It's a point that I didn't get attached to fuzzy sets or fuzzy logic. Uh, no, that, that, I, I don't think that would be a good idea. Right. But, uh, so, but people know. Yeah, now, yeah. They know that it's associated with all that. Uh, just as in the case of Shannon, they know it's information theory. Even though his name is not, not really associated. So that's good enough for me. That's, uh, that's good enough. Now, okay. Now, let me ask you another question. Once you start introducing this, this, this you know, fuzzy sets, at the same period of time, the whole field of artificial intelligence was was arising in, in some way dealing with very similar issues. And I'm sure you had some 
Could you comment? Uh, uh, you had uh, clearly a lot of interaction with these people. Could you comment a little bit about your yeah. interaction with the AI community? Yeah. Well, uh, I have always been uh, close to the AI community. I was not a card carrying member, but always close. So people who are considered to be leaders like Minsky and McCarthy, uh, I knew quite well and still have close relationship with them. So, but at the same time, uh, I was not completely, uh, let's say, I uh, can't think of the right word to describe it, but not in tune with the directions. AI was very, as you said, based on logic and the two valid logic. Now, AI came into existence in 1956. So, my paper, as it says, appeared in 65. So, by 65, there was something in AI. But it was very much too valid logic oriented. I was out of sympathy with that. So that when I started spicy sets and things of this kind, I felt that it is important for AI to broaden itself and to consider other logical systems, in particular fuzzy logic. And my conviction was and remains that to do AI, AI should be based on fuzzy logic. Now, saying that, I realize, of course, that uh, this statement would be rejected out of hands by the AI community. The AI community is still uh, very happy with two added logic, and, uh, uh, and uh, but the time will come when things will change. Let me give you an example. The founders of AI, above all McCarthy and Minsky, were very logic oriented, McCarthy more so than Minsky. Probability was a bad word in AI yeah. until Giorgio Pearl began to write something on probability theory with sort of AI oriented. And it is thanks to him that probability made its way into, into AI. And today, the new AI is probability oriented. My colleague Stuart Russell, Peter Dormick, his co author, and many other people are very much probability oriented. So, logic oriented AI is not used that much, it has never really found that many applications. People talk about non-monotogic, non-monotogic logic, you, you and I talk about it, McDermott, this, that. Right in the very beginning, I said it will not get anywhere. Today, non-monotogic logic is largely neglected. Very, very few people talk about it. And uh, right at that time, they thought they could apply to common sense reasoning and all kinds of things. You have to use fuzzy logic to deal with common sense reasoning. So, so I still maintain, I contend, that AI has to be based on fuzzy logic. Now, if I had said in, uh, let's say, 19 in the mid-60s that probability theory should be a part of AI. People at that time uh, would strongly disagree with but eventually probability theory. Yeah, was yeah. Simple. The same thing with have fuzzy logic. So it may take 5 years, 10 or 15 years, but eventually they say, you know what, perhaps Zada was not quite as stupid mm. as uh, we thought he was. Now that, let me ask you a question in regards to this. At best, I think the people in the logical approach to AI, at best they just sort of didn't pay attention to fuzzy sets, very frankly. I mean, they, but now on the other hand, the people in the probabilistic domain, 
have been much more aggressively challenging fights. It's not been, you know, benign neglect. It's been more of a kind of, almost like a hostility. Could you comment a little bit about the? You understand what I'm saying, I think, you know? Because there isn't that much competition, really, uh, between fuzzy set theory and logic, or even fuzzy logic, uh, logic. but uh, there is a uh, bit between beauty theory and fuzzy logic. There should be, but there are many people in probability theory who view fuzzy logic as a competitor, and uh, so there is a natural tendency to knock your competitor. That's part of American, you know, tradition. And uh, so what has become very popular is Bayesianism. Bayesianism. Most people who call themselves Bayesians or probabilists, they don't even know what Bayesian is. But they basically, Bayesianism is equated to probability theory. It is not, but that's the way it's equated. And uh, so you're right. Uh, I frequently encounter that kind of hostility. And uh, uh, I don't want to mention names, but not long ago I had an exchange of messages with somebody. Uh, he, he was extremely hostile toward physiology. And hostile in an aggressive way, that is, he would try to persuade other people to not to support fuzzy logic, to uh, not to hire any people who do work in fuzzy logic, in a very aggressive way. Now, in this regard, I guess, let me ask you a more personal question. Maybe you can provide some advice for some people. In other words, in other words, in other words you've, over the years now, you have sort of overcome a lot of animosity and a lot of resistance to what your ideas and you per persevered over these years. And could you make some advice for, for people who are kind of may find themselves in a similar position? How to you know we have any hints how to deal with that kind of problem, this kind of animosity and you understand my question? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think there are two kinds of animosities. One is when uh, you really know a person well and you don't like that person. That's one kind of animosity. And the other kind of animosity is when you don't know the person, but for some reason you don't like that person because of race, color, or whatever. You don't like that person. So if you deal, let's go with the first kind, uh, it is difficult. It's difficult because there is some sort of an interesting conflict. But uh, in many, many cases, in my experience, animosity is based on unfamiliarity. It's not really deep-seated animosity. And if it is based on unfamiliarity, then the best thing is to be gracious about it. So if somebody says that, I don't believe in what you're doing, I think you're doing, everything you're doing is wrong, Say thank you, I appreciate what you said, and so forth. And in some cases, I, it's not serious, but to stop some sort of discussion, say, you know what, if somebody says something that you really don't agree with, you can say, well, uh, I agree with you uh, almost completely, but in some minor ways, you know, <laughs> I view things a little differently, and then you proceed to talk about it. But anyway, you start with saying it's a minor difference. Minor difference, that's one way. Uh, the other thing is to say, you know what, uh, I agree with everything that you did not say. <laughs> that stops it. <laughs> that's, remember that, I agree with everything that you did not say. <laughs> But my experience has been this, that uh, there were quite a few cases where initially my relationship was not good. Not that I felt badly about the person, 
But that person did not like me, you see. I could see that I didn't like me. But I did not respond to God, and eventually became good friends. And the most uh, uh, sort of uh, prominent example of that is my relationship with Professor John R. Ragazzini at Columbia University. When I started at Columbia University as an instructor, I was asked to be his assistant. And I could see that he doesn't like me. I could, he didn't even yeah. try to hide it, you see. Very obvious. And, uh, but, you know, uh, look at it. To make the story short, eventually we became the best friends. And uh, there are many uh, other examples where you start with hostility, one-sided. Yeah. But eventually. Uh, so, but in general, also, I must tell you something about myself. I take a benign view of people. I take general benign view of people. And the reason why I take a benign view of people is because I grew up, I was fortunate to grow, to grow up in an environment in which almost everybody that I was in contact with was good. It's hard for me to uh, think of situations or circumstances where this was not the case. It was the case when I was in Baku. I was not quite 10 years old, later on uh, that